The Siege of Jerusalem was a massive military endeavor the likes of which had not been seen since the fall of Carthage two centuries earlier. Starting in April of 70 AD and lasting nearly five months, the battle would be a brutal, no-holds-barred brawl fought over every inch of the city. At stake was the success of the Great Revolt in Judea and the survival of the Jewish people. Roman involvement in Judea first began in 63 BC when Pompey the Great was drawn into a Jewish civil war and eventually seized Jerusalem. However, the region saw much turbulence during the final years of the Republic and was taken over by the Parthians before legions returned to install the puppet King Herod. Eventually, a series of procurators oversaw Judea, but these largely lacked the competency or military power to impose order. Roman authority was highly dependent on local elites who themselves often lacked the confidence or respect of the Jewish people. On top of this, the population of Judea was divided across lines of class, ethnic, and religious divisions. As a result, the region was highly unstable. Revolutions seemed perpetually around the corner. In May of 66 AD, rioting amongst the people was met by the heavy-handed overreaction of the Roman procurator Florus, who only further incensed the situation by plundering southwest Jerusalem and killing 3,600 people. As the situation escalated, reinforcements soon arrived from Caesarea, only to be driven out by a rebellion that now spread to the entire region. Jerusalem was taken by Jewish rebels, while Roman strongholds were eliminated in Judea and Perea. Roman efforts to combat the uprising were led by Vespasian and his son Titus, under orders from the Emperor Nero. The campaign season of 67 AD saw Vespasian advance south from Antioch and focus his efforts on subduing Galilee. Field battles were virtually unheard of, given the huge advantage the Romans held, and most of the fighting was concentrated around fortifications. This resulted in particularly brutal treatment of any populations which did not submit immediately. Rome often acted particularly strict to make a point. During the 68 AD offensive in Judea, for instance, cities downstream of the Roman army learned of their approach not by messengers, but by the arrival of bodies floating down the Jordan River. The campaign ground to a halt with the news of Nero's death. The anarchy that followed was known as the Year of Four Emperors and included a bid for power by Vespasian on July 1st, 69 AD. By the summer of 70 AD, he had come out the victor and set sail for Rome to claim his prize. Titus was left in command of the Judean campaign with instructions to put an end to the Jewish uprising. This, of course, meant the long-delayed assault on Jerusalem, home to the rebel leaders and the heart of the resistance. Titus began the Jerusalem campaign in the spring of 70 AD. His army of four legions was assembled in Alexandria and marched north to Caesarea along the shoreline. Supporting his force were 23 cohorts of auxiliary infantry, eight ally of cavalry, and numerous detachments of local troops provided by the region's client rulers. Historical records seem to claim that this force numbered around 60,000 men. These estimates imply that the core legionary troops made up around 35% of the army, the auxiliary troops about 32%, and the remaining local forces about 33%. Such a high proportion of local troops does raise some doubts on the accuracy of our sources. However, we may speculate that local rulers were eager to donate men to the war effort in a political bid to secure Rome's goodwill amidst a bloody revolt. The Roman commanders themselves may also have been eager to have additional troops at their side. While the local forces were surely not as reliable as the crack legionaries, they could take on many responsibilities of the army and thus free up the elite troops to do what they did best. This would be especially important in the upcoming siege of a city as large and well fortified as Jerusalem. The Roman forces approached Jerusalem in separate marching columns due to the security and supply constraints of the Judean hill country. Titus led both the 12th and 15th legions by the most direct road while the 5th Macedonica approached via Emmaus and the 10th Fratensis approached via Jericho. On April 23rd, the lead units of the 12th and 15th legions arrived on the hills to the north of the city. That night, the 5th Macedonica arrived and by morning, the rest of the army entered the battlefield. Before them lay the great city with gleaming temples and stout battlements. The city of Jerusalem is surrounded on three sides by steep ravines. To the east lies the Kidron Valley, 
to the west, the Gihon Valley, and sweeping around the south is the Hinnom Valley. A series of hills surround the area, including the famed Mount of Olives to the east. Ancient Jerusalem itself was built atop several key topographic features. The city incorporated two spurs of land with the Tyropean Valley in between. Atop the eastern spur stood the Temple Mount and the Antonia Fortress. The heights of the western spur were occupied by the elites who had built the upper city during the Ashmonian and Herodian periods. In the middle of these two areas sprawled the more ancient and crowded lower city, which held most of the population. Both the upper and lower cities were enclosed by a wall, which was anchored on the flank by the massive fortifications around the Temple Mount. Inevitably, the population outgrew its bounds, and the second city was developed north of the first wall. This exposed position was soon surrounded by a second wall, which ran from the Antonia in the east to the Genoth Gate in the west. By the first century AD, yet another suburb had sprung up to the north known as the New City. Once again, expansion necessitated fortifications, and in 41 AD, Herod Agrippa commissioned the construction of the Third Wall. This was an ambitious project with massive stone blocks meant to enclose a large area. It seems that the scale of the defensive works raised some suspicion amongst the Romans who forced their client king to abandon the project before its completion. Over the course of the Jewish revolt, however, the people of Jerusalem managed to put the finishing touches on their third layer of battlements. By the time the legions arrived outside Jerusalem, the walls had been raised an additional 9 meters and a series of square towers were built projecting outwards. The combination of tough terrain and stout walls made for a formidable three-layered defensive network. Additionally, the maze of narrow streets between the fortifications could be easily blockaded, while numerous underground water and sewage passages meant that defenders could emerge from any direction for a surprise attack on intruders. Bunkered within this massive, fortified city was a garrison of approximately 20,000 Jewish troops. However, these were not professional forces. Rather, they were a motley assortment of militiamen, refugees, and zealots. This composition is a reflection of the thoroughly fractured nature of the Jewish resistance. Since the outbreak of the revolt, an effective, centralized government had failed to take form, and the resistance suffered from a chronic failure to synergize its various factions. Jerusalem had been divided along party lines and was tearing itself apart in bloody political infighting right up until the arrival of Roman forces. The principal leaders were Simon Gioras, who lay claim to the upper city, and John of Gishala, who was based out of the Temple Mount. Simon led the larger of the two forces, which included 10,000 men under 50 officers and 6,000 allied Idumeans under 8 commanders. These troops garrisoned the first wall from the Kidron all the way to the Palace of the Kings. On the other side of the city, John had an armed following of around 6,000 men under 20 officers and was joined by Eleazar with his 2,400 zealots. These forces held the Temple Mount along with the surrounding neighborhoods including the Ophel and the Tyropean Valley. Traditional Jewish fighters were lightly armed and armored. They fought at range with slings, bows, and javelins before closing in with spears, swords, and clubs. While agile and determined, they often stood no chance in a straight-up engagement against Roman forces, especially heavy cavalry. However, the Jews in Jerusalem were much better prepared than was typical. They had been amassing equipment from Jewish workshops, Herodian armories, arms dealers, deserters, and defeated enemies. A substantial amount of gear had been gathered from the defeated Romans at Beth Haran, including an array of artillery pieces. In addition, the confused mess of siege warfare would negate many of the advantages a Roman force would enjoy in a field battle. Lastly, it must be said that the morale of the defenders was strengthened by the inevitable survival instincts that took hold when a city resolved to fight or die. While considering the armies is important, we would do well to remember that sieges are battles of attrition. As such, it is necessary to ask about the food and water supplies. Fresh water, at least, was not of immediate concern, owing to the presence of numerous cisterns around the city, as well as several massive pools which trapped rainwater. Food, on the other hand, was in short supply. During the infighting that preceded the siege, many of the grain stores had been raided or destroyed by opposing parties. In addition, 
The already huge population of Jerusalem had swelled to dangerous levels in recent weeks with the arrival of pilgrims celebrating Passover. The non-combatant populace far outnumbered the armed defenders and imposed severe limitations on the length supplies could last. Once the Romans closed in on Jerusalem, the countdown began. The Roman army had undergone a long march to reach Jerusalem. Titus recognized that his men were exhausted and ordered that they construct preliminary camps out of range of the city. The 12th and 15th legions who had arrived from the northeast began to set up a kilometer away, atop Mount Scopus, with another camp planned for the 5th Macedonica, 550 meters further back. As the legions moved into place, Titus rode ahead to personally survey the defenses. On the morning of April 23rd, he set off with 600 horsemen, following the road that led to the main gate of the third wall. However, the terrain was uneven and cluttered with gardens, olive groves, hedges, fences, walls, and stone structures which had been knocked down by the defenders. In other words, he walked into a maze of obstacles. All of a sudden, Jewish forces burst out of the gate and swarmed the Roman column, cutting it in half. Cavalry men in the rear bolted out into the open country they had come from. Meanwhile, Titus and his escorts were left behind. The general had neglected to wear his helmet or breastplate for the expedition, but nonetheless drew his sword and led a charge to break out. According to Josephus, he quote, diverted those perpetually with his sword that came on his side, overturned many of those that directly met him, and made his horse ride over those that were overthrown, end quote. The encounter was a close call, but ultimately the Romans were able to cut their way through, though they lost several men and left many injured. Titus was likely shaken by the event and eager to get the siege underway. He ordered the 10th Fratensis to move even closer and began constructing entrenchments atop the Mount of Olives. However, the Jews were emboldened by their near success and decided to follow up with a massive assault. Sorties poured out of the eastern and southern gateways, their sights set on the working legionaries. Fighters streamed across the Kidron Valley and descended upon the half-built camp of the 10th Fratensis. The Romans were caught completely off guard. Jewish troops started cutting down their disorganized opponents while more reinforcements rushed out from the city to complete the route. Titus attacked the flank with his bodyguard, which was enough to force the mob back down the ravine. The 10th Fratensis resumed work, only to come under a second assault from Jews who had been steadily bringing in more and more men. This ferocious attack overwhelmed the Roman force on the low ground. Many of the soldiers fled for the heights, while Titus and a band of troops attempted to hold the line. Soon after, the legionaries regrouped and countercharged down the hill, driving the Jews back once more. In the ensuing lull, the camp fortifications were finally completed. This secured the Roman forward position, but left everyone with a reminder that the strength of the Jewish defense had been dangerously underestimated. In response, Titus now took precautions against further counterattacks. He posted cavalry divisions to deflect attacks and ordered that the ground between the Roman camps and the walls be cleared of all obstructions. This meant cutting down trees, flattening hedges, filling in ditches, and destroying rock projections. This had the dual purpose of removing any cover for Jewish sorties, as well as preparing the ground for siege works. The Roman army had effectively rolled up its sleeves. It was time to get to work. <laughs> 